So welcome to the third Analyze Like an Editor workshop. These are something I wanted to do. Um, well, it started at the pandemic. I think I told a couple of y'all that the first time we did this, when I heard from a lot of writers that they were having trouble creating because of all the upset to our schedules and everybody was stressed out and they were frustrated with that. So I kept telling authors, there's so much you can do for your writing, even when you're not creating just from analyzing, you know, what were we doing at the beginning of the pandemic? We were binge watching and binge reading. Um, yes, Alice, I will get the link in. If you scroll up the link to the, um, uh, the guide that I created for this should be there, but if not, I'll put it there in just a minute. So not only is it something that we could do when we were, you know, just sitting around on the sofa, uh, worrying and watching television and reading, but it's one of the best things you can do to improve your own writing. One of the reasons that it's really easy as an editor to get that um, big picture view of craft is because we have the built-in objectivity on somebody else's writing that we don't have on our own writing, any of us as writers. So to be able to analyze really um, objectively and assess what you see on the page in someone else's writing when you're not filling in all the blanks like we are in our own work is incredibly valuable to just internalize this stuff. I've created, um, I have a course on it called How to Train Your Editor Brain. And this is sort of based on that. So uh, you guys already know if you're here that we just pick a few chapters of something. I'm gonna start shaking it up soon and we're gonna do uh, next week, we're gonna, next month, we're gonna do a podcast. And I'm going to bring in some other mediums that we can analyze as well, but I'm also trying to shake up genres. But it's sort of based on that technique and we're, it's a little free flowing in here. One of the reasons I wanted to start doing these pretty casually is just because I'm trying to find what will work best to help you guys practice the ability to analyze like an editor, basically, and be able to bring these, um, these craft elements into your own work. So uh, let me just really quickly go through the technique we're going to use. Hang on. Is the tech that trips me up as anybody who's been here already knows. Okay. So it's kind of a, a three-step process, but it's not as fancy as it sounds. And it's based on the way that I, as an editor, by the way, hi, I'm Tiffany Yates Martin. I'm the founder of Foxprint Editorial. I'm the author of Intuitive Editing. I've been a career book editor for 30 years. <laughs> um, and just analyzing literally hundreds, if not thousands of manuscripts over the years has made all this craft stuff second nature to me. And that's what I think is so valuable about it for writers. And you're already reading, but to be able to read analytically like this is the skill that I think is worth developing that will help your own writing. So the first step is what I do, my process uh, when I'm editing a work is that the first thing I do is I just read it like a book. I don't try to make notes. I don't think too much about it. I just absorb it. I orient myself to the story. And then I do what I call feeling the story, which is just investigating my own overall reactions to it. I'm going to look at um, how did I feel about it? How engaged was I? What, um, what are my overall impressions? It's kind of the thing you do like when you go see a movie or you read a book and someone asks you what you think about it. It's just really that generalized. And then we start following that backward because that's how we're going to uh, kind of reverse engineer all the craft elements and how the author created those effects in us. Because that's all we're doing as writers, right? We're trying to create certain effects in our reader. We're trying to bring them into our vision and carry them along on the journey we want them to go on. And we're sort of benignly manipulating them. <laughs> so we're going to see how uh, authors do that well or not well. It's equally instructive to analyze things that you don't care for or that don't seem to work very well. After that, my second step is I start looking at the storytelling elements really specifically, kind of one by one. Like how's, what did I think about the character? Was I invested in them? If I didn't like them, was I still invested in them? And if so, why? How did the author do that? That's one big question authors have is, do my characters have to be likable? They don't, but they do have to be engaging. They do have to make readers want to follow them. And it's useful to see how other storytellers and authors do that. Um, I'll talk about the Holy Trinity in a minute, which is character stakes and plot, which to me is the foundation of all story. And so those are the, that's where I start. And I just kind of start thinking about those. And again, I'm not really writing anything down yet. I'm not working too hard at it. I'm just going through it. 
Um, and then I'll look at the places where I was most affected. If there was a place, let's say, where I put the book down or turn the movie off or um, where I was on the edge of my seat or where I was emotionally affected, that's a really great place to start digging and see what exactly, what were you feeling? Why were you feeling it? What craft element is that? And how did the author do it? And then we're going to analyze those. And then the last step is the one everybody wants to start with because <laughs> I call it the sexy part. Um, this is what a lot of authors do. As I said, most of us are huge readers and a lot of us will even take what we're reading and analyze it, go through it, annotate you know the parts that we really like that we're affecting. But I think what that often can do is skip over this foundational stuff I just talked about. So it's more prose oriented than story oriented. This is also incredibly helpful because we're gonna do this after we do the first two less sexy parts. We're going to do this just literally going through the manuscript. We're not going to do all 50 pages, but we're going to skip through and go, you know, what was the author doing here? What effect did she achieve? What is the purpose of this line or this paragraph? And what does it tell us about the story? How does it move it forward? But when you're doing your own reading, try to do the first two steps first, because it really is what internalizes this stuff to you and gives you, you'll see in a minute when we start doing it, this foundation. For the third sexy part. Um, and I think that's all. Yeah, we already know that. So let me stop sharing. And we're just going to, we're going to do a poll because that's fun. <laughs> so I'm try I try to make these as interactive as I can. Hang on, let me get rid of my slideshow. The first time we did this, my husband was my tech guy and it was the best because uh, I didn't have to do any of this, but he's not very available. So you have to deal with me and I'm sorry. Um, so let's start with a poll because those are fun. And this is, remember, we're going to do this step by step. If you, um, I don't know if you got the, well, I'm going to copy it and paste it for you guys. I don't know if you got the guide that I just sent, whoever was just asking about that, but I'm going to stick it Yes, I see you nodding, Krista. Great. So this is basically the step one of that. We're just going to talk about how we feel about the story generally, if I can find the poll, which I will, if you'll all bear with me. Sorry. Maybe I can't. Maybe we just have to do this verbally. Um, yep, I found it. Isn't this fun? The tech part is a ton of fun for me, too. All right, if we don't see this poll, please chat and tell me that. But I'm gonna launch it right now. Nope, nope, it turns out this is beyond my technical skill. There we go. Okay, thanks for your patience all. So, Basically, this is that question I was talking about, about just feeling the story. How effective did it feel overall? The whole thing, wow, these are not, oh yeah, these are, I forgot. So five is like really effective. There's zero, which I didn't know I put on there. Uh, so the lower the number, the less affected you were. Hang on, let me pop my chat window up. There we go. Okay. Um, Doug, good observation. Hang on to that sucker. Glad you got the email for the, for the, um, oh, we have someone from Nairobi. How fun. Okay. Um, all right. Everybody has answered. So we've got pretty good score here. Most everybody found this fairly affected, effective, and we're fairly engaged. So once you have, there you go, you can see the results. All right. Um, once you have sort of evaluated your feelings about it, start getting really specific about that. So what is it about that that affected you? Did you feel, and this you can start putting in the chats, um, did you feel emotionally engaged at any point? Did you feel on the edge of your seat? Did, the, did you care about the characters? Um, did the momentum feel strong? Did it carry you through all the way? Did you read it in one go? Let's look at some of our chats here. Um, yeah, that's Doug. Hold on to that point about the twist. We're going to talk about that. Thank you for posting the link to the guide. 
You know, let me get rid of this. Um, Carol, interesting observation. She was engaged, but she did not like the characters. This is valuable because we talked about that a minute ago. A lot of times you will have characters that are unlikable. We watched the show um, House of Cards. There's another one called House of Lies. Both of them equally good. Both of them had incredibly unlikable characters, but it can be so instructive to figure out why you house a show like that. Why do we keep watching? Why do we keep reading? Why do we read Lolita when the characters, the, the lead character is so potentially disturbing and unlikable? Um, and we'll talk more about that. Claudia, oh, Claudia said, my heart was pounding. I felt like he was beating me. This is a really good observation too, because that is telling us something about suspense and tension. It's also telling us about immediacy. And remember what we're trying to do as authors is viscerally affect our readers, keep them engaged, drawn in, hooked, and make them feel something. And so great that this is doing that for you. Um, Alice says, Callie was very relatable. That is the prologue character, the babysitter, tired and annoyed at a bratty kid. I think we can, most of us can relate to that. Chris read all the way through, engaging, but also skimmed a lot because you didn't like it. This is also really um, a good comment because you can, especially if you're an editor, not ever, I mean, I have the luxury of being able to largely choose the stuff I work on. And so I do choose things that excite me that I really want to work on, but you don't always have that luxury and you may not always be working on um, a story that is your particular jam, but it's still instructive to be able to analyze it objectively and see what is and is not working and separate your subjective feelings about the story from how well the author executes her vision for it, how effective it is on the page. Um, uh, let's see, Nan said, but he was so disgusting. I want to talk about character a little bit in just a minute. She were glad he got his. She liked the reveal about Callie being 14. I'm going to talk about that in a minute uh, as far as specificity. Kara says she was driven by dread to turn pages. That's fantastic because this is a suspense thriller, basically. And that's that's the point, right? The people who read this genre, that's what we want to feel. That, oh God, I don't want to turn the next page, but I have to, to see what happened. Gayla was engaged. Cynthia grabbed from the get-go. Hey girl, fellow Southerner, and held her there. Susan says, compelling and draws her in, but hated the sexual exploitation. I had thoughts about that as well. Karen was very engaged in the prologue. Oh, I should probably say for any of those watching the recording that we are analyzing Karen Slaughter's false witness. Um, and I think that's how she pronounces it because I have a friend who spells her name that way and it's a German name, but I could be wrong. Karen was very engaged in the prologue, but found the constant COVID references in chapter one pulled me out. We're gonna get to that too. Um, touched in the prologue when Trevor says, I love you, Callie. Okay. Let's just start talking about some of these elements we've, we're doing, you guys are great about picking out these specific things that you are reacting to. So once you've done that, once you know, for example, Doug, I'm going to go to your comment just because it's sitting there. You are touched by something in the prologue. What about that makes it effective to you for the purposes of the story? If you continued reading, you know what the reveal is. Um, big spoiler for anyone watching that Trevor is, or Andrew in the second chapter, who is a suspected rapist, is the child Trevor from the first chapter. So you were touched when Trevor says, I love you, Callie. I thought it was really interesting how Slaughter created little glimpses of Trevor as a sweet boy that the way he throws his arms around her, um, all the typical little kid stuff he does. She gives him the batter and he buries his head in it like Pooh Bear in the honey pot, which is also a very innocent metaphor, right? So she is contrasting that early in. I think it's in that same paragraph when the boy throws his arms and says he loves her, where he, she says he came up behind her like a serial killer. So she's developing these contrasts that keep you a little off balance. That one, the serial killer one, I think is a little subtler because we don't yet know that Trevor is going to turn out to be a bad seed. We don't even know what the scene, what's gonna happen in the scene. It seems like just an ordinary domestic scene, but it introduces a little thread of unease and that's tension. Tension is that feeling of friction and obstacle, something that makes us 
uneasy or need resolution. And she does that really well and really subtly all the way through using these contrasts of some of the concern, like he's, he says, she says something about the fish and he goes, well, you said they didn't live very long anyway. Like that's a, a disturbing thing for a child to think like, it's okay if I kill the fish because they have a short lifespan. And she has this great snarky thought about it. But also right on the heels of that, he's doing these sweet little boy things. And so that keeps us as the reader just a little bit off balance. And that's great. You want to keep questions in the reader's mind. That's how you keep us hooked. Um, let's dig into a couple other ones. Krista says, I lost, uh, we're going to stick in character for a while. I almost always start with character because to me, every story is a character story. I always say, if y'all have taken any of my courses or read my book, you know that um, I always say readers don't care what's happening until they care who it's happening to. But that is the truest thing I know about story. Even the most plot driven story, if it's about some, you know, faceless or amorphous person that we just don't have any personal investment in, we may read it. It may be an interesting yarn, but we're going to keep a distance from it. So if you want to draw your readers in, you do it with character. So I always start there. So uh, Krista, we're going to go to your comment. And I know I'm behind on comments because it turns out this is a hard way to do it. But when we have enough people in here, it seems easiest um, trying to get people to talk. Got a little chaotic the first time. So um, we're just trying some stuff. I appreciate y'all's patience in helping me work through things. Krista says she lost empathy for the protagonist because of her drinking with the kid in the house. And then the male character was so horrible that I started feeling empathy for the protagonist again. Tension is one of the most powerful forces you can use in any story you're writing, any genre you're writing. And all it is, is friction. Basically, it's a push-pull is how I think of it. It's not always disagreement. It's not always conflict. Um, but it is something that keeps the reader off balance, something that stands in the way of the character and what they want, something that um, you know, smooth sailing is what we want in life. We want no tension. We want to know where everybody stands. We want everything to be pleasant. But if we read that story, it's boring as hell and we put it down. So you want to keep that, I call it chop on the water. You want to keep a constant sense of just a little bit of friction all the time. And it can be as, it can be huge. It can be a fight like in this scene, or it can be those little moments that Krista's sort of Krista's pointing out sort of the bigger ones, but like little moments, like a character is hoping for a smile from another character and gets a frown or a yes. And they get a no, it doesn't have to be huge stuff. So I think that what she, what Slaughter did here is very effective because we're talking about the empathy for the protagonist. She does seem kind of awful in some ways. She's also not like, even before we have sympathy for her because of Buddy and how terrible he is. Even though Callie is a little frustrated with this boy, she's drinking. Um, she, yeah, I guess mostly just drinking a lot. <laughs> but she also is making him cookies and she's concerned about him and she kisses his head and she genuinely seems to care about him. So already we've got those opposing forces that keep her interesting, right? She's not all good. She's not all bad. Gray area is where the juice is in your stories. But then Buddy comes in and whatever lack of sympathy we might have been experiencing because of her behavior, now suddenly there's a new element that throws her behavior in a different light. All of a sudden, when we see what Buddy is like, maybe we're like, well, hell yeah, she drinks. I would drink as well. Her life is clearly miserable. So look at how the, the author is creating this stuff. Um, Thank you, Krista, for the comment. She says that the workshops help her give good feedback in writing class. This, this is the kind of thing, too. Think about if you are in beta reader groups or critique groups. This is the kind of critique that you can give each other that is useful. A lot of times you'll get um, in a critique group, you'll get a lot of people who tell you what you should be doing or why what you did is wrong. And that is not entirely useful. Or they may be vague and just say, well, I didn't like it. Or, you know, it, it was slow in the middle. That doesn't give you the specifics that you need to be actionable in making the revisions you want to. So these are actually, this whole guide that I put the link up to can also be a good guideline for critique class or critique groups. Mm. A couple of people have talked about the immediacy of the fight. You know, before we get into that, I want to talk about couple of things in the prologue. I want to talk about the length. Did anybody have issues 
with the length of both of these chapters because together they were 50 pages. The prologue itself was 8,000 words, which in a normal like 80,000 word book, that's a 10th of the book. And also there's a lot of feelings about prologues in general in the industry. You guys may have heard a lot of people tell you never use them, which is total BS. Please ignore that advice. But if you're going to use them, use them well. Um, I, if you're interested, I have a class that I'm working on coming up next month with Jane Friedman, all about the prologue. But I picked this one deliberately because this is a very lengthy prologue. And I want to talk a little bit about what we thought about that. So I want to talk about the length of it. I want to talk about the effectiveness of it. I'm going to scroll down to the new comments. Oh, yeah. Okay, here we go. We got a lot of long stuff. Nan says both felt too long. Gayla thinks it went on a little too long. I think you mean the prologue. The connection between them took a long time to emerge. I think you mean, Nan, the connection between Andrew and Trevor. Um, and that. That I think was partly deliberate because that's a reveal, right? And we're going to talk about that in a minute because a lot of times as writers, we're trying to hold back certain information to keep the reader interested so that we have that reveal. And I, uh, she does that twice, once in the prologue and once in the chapter one. And I want to talk about it because there's good questions and bad questions. There's good ways to keep your reader on the hook and there's bad ways that feel manipulative or coy or cryptic. Um, Chris found the length long and it made him skim. Alice says the prologue was essential to the rest of the book. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Mm. Doug said the prologue moved much more quickly than the first chapter to him. Um, Claudia said it didn't feel like a prologue. Yeah, it wasn't really written like a prologue. It was written more like a chapter and, and it's not labeled a prologue, but it, basically it is effectively because it happens long before the story begins. And full disclosure, I've not read the full book yet, but I'm presuming we don't go back to the past again, that this is not some sort of dual timeline. Um, Bobby says, <laughs> this is a great observation. Bobby doesn't think a debut author or an author who isn't a bestseller would have been able to have such a long prologue. So I mentioned this in the last one we did. Authors who are successful or have a track record or a reputation or large existing readership have a lot of power in publishing to dictate how much editing they do or don't want, what changes they do or don't want to make. Um, I think I told this story last time, but I copy edited Walter Mosley once. And I went to one of his events because I wanted to meet him. And I was going, I was, I always waited to tell someone I was their copy editor. That's the person who checks all the like grammar and spelling because some authors love their copy editor and some authors hate their guts because they're very pedantic and that's our job. Um, but it's really annoying as an, if a poor copy edit can change the author's voice. So I, I always feel the author out to see, do they want to know who I am? Um, because it was anonymous when I worked with publishers, they never really knew me. So I listened to his talk to his talk. And at the end of it, somebody asked him a question about revisions. And they said, what do you do if your publisher wants you to make revisions on a story? And he goes, I tell them that I am more than happy to take that manuscript and leave and go to another publisher. And I was like, mm, okay. <laughs> so I did not introduce myself, but you have that power once you are successful. So what that can sometimes result in, first of all, you get a lot more leeway with stuff like this. Second of all, um, and I'm not saying that's the case with Car and Slaughter at all, but sometimes later books from an author who has been well-established are not as strong as earlier books, not because an editor is putting their stamp on it or making the story good, but it's that reflection, that mirror of your story, what is on the page. Because honestly, left to our own devices, are we not all just a little bit perhaps self-indulgent when we tell a story? Or if we're not mindful of our audience, it can be easy to be a blowhard or lose our point or just assume everybody's riveted by every word out of our mouth and not take the time to really hone it the way you do when there's, when you don't have that reputation. So that's a good um, observation. I think you're right. And probably a newer author who came in with a prologue quite this long would have been encouraged to shorten it. And I think there's room to shorten it, which I want to talk about specifically when we do the line by line. Um, Susan liked the length of both, thought it were, really was working for her. So again, these are all subjective things. And I say that every time we do this, but art's a subjective medium. So what is effective? Well, it... <sighs> It is based in craft elements. Every reader is also different. 
And some of you may be a reader in this genre. Some of you may not. Some of you may like more fast paced. Some of you may like a more lyrical, you know, literary type of approach to stuff. So there's no right or wrong answers to any of this. We're looking at our impressions. And when you are an author, that's what a beta, that's what beta readers are for. That's what your critique group is for. That's what your editor is for to give you that objective impression, but none of those people are necessarily right. They're just helping you find out what is actually coming across on the page. And it's up to you to determine how closely that reflects your vision for the story. Um, so let's talk about that prologue. Actually, we're going to go through that. Let's do a poll just for fun. And then we'll talk about that prologue because we're going to do the line by line in just a minute. Uh, let's look at the Holy Trinity. We talked a little bit about character. But so the Holy Trinity, remember, is character and plot and stakes. And basically, I just want to know how effective you felt each of these elements were. And I'll keep talking while you fill this out. Um, character, basically, not necessarily were they likable, but were you engaged? Did they feel fully fleshed? Did you understand their motivations? Um, did they keep you interested and engaged? Plot, did I launch this? Nobody is, I don't, oh, there we go. Um, plot. Again, not necessarily was it good, did you like it, but did it feel cohesive? Did it hold together for you? Did it engage your interest? Was it effective on the page? Did you care about what was happening? Did you understand what was happening? And then stakes, that's basically what the characters, the main characters in each one have to gain or lose and why what's happening matters to them, but also objectively. What I'm seeing right now, and uh, we've got 15 of you who've answered, so I'm going to give you another couple of minutes. This is a lot bigger spread than I expected, and that's really interesting. Uh, the last two we did, we had pretty uniform results, but it's interesting, especially stakes is way. Um, we got 61. I'm going to give it one more second while I have some coffee. Crystal wants to know if I can explain the stakes a little bit more. Yeah, it's... Um, if what the character has to gain or lose in a scene is not clear or not important enough to them, if it doesn't matter enough, then reader engagement will be low. So um, that doesn't mean they have to be objectively large stakes. One example I always give is a, oh, here's a, here's a good example. My, one of my favorite movies on earth, can't recommend it enough. We'll probably analyze it someday. I love you, man. Silly bromance, a ton of fun though. The whole basis of it, what's at stake for the main character is that the woman he is marrying has so many friends that she has a ton of attendance for their upcoming wedding and he has none because he's always been a girlfriend guy. He's, his whole world's about his girlfriend. So the whole movie, what's at stake is will he find friends to be his attendants? Will he find the best man basically to be his attendant at his wedding? So objectively, that's really not a very important stake, but it is important to him and because of that, it is high stakes in the story, to me anyway. Um, I'm going to end this poll, and I'm going to share the results so that you guys can see. So with character, um, that's a pretty good spread. We've got most people thought that the character was, um, let's say, effective and engaging. But we do have some people who were meh on it, and we're going to hear from y'all. And then plot, that's a pretty good solid four, which I thought was interesting for two reasons. One, in this genre, you expect it to be pretty tightly plotted. And in some ways, I think this was, but I do agree that um, if you think about what actually happens in the prologue in chapter one, for example, in the prologue, what happens is a woman who is, we learn babysitting a child, um, finds a camera and the man we assume her husband at first, who she lives with, who put it there, turns violent when she finds it and she has to fight for her life and winds up killing him. Um, and then in chapter one, what happens is a woman who is divorced and struggling in a relationship with her child gets a call from work that a client wants to see her, a rape, uh, a new client who has been accused of rape and has requested her specifically. And she goes and finds out that it's someone that she knows. So that's, that's not really objectively that much happening. And yet we've got 50 pages on it. So it does not shock me that most of our ratings here on plot fall a little bit in the middle and then stakes. Hmm. 
I would like to hear from some of y'all. Uh, so we got a little spread on here too, for those of you watching the replay who aren't seeing this. We got, these are all over the map, actually. There's a good chunk of high stakes, 29%. But then we got a good chunk of like medium high stakes, uh, 29%. I didn't mean to put 10 on here. That confuses people one to 10 instead of one to five, because it gives you a lot of... Um, a lot of different rankings, but we have most of it falls in the meaty part of the bell curve toward the good side, like high stakes. But then we've got 18%, which is not small, sort of thought stakes were medium low. I would like to hear about those people too. So I'm going to stop sharing that. Oh, I guess I could have shared the results and you could, could all have seen it. Um, I'll just scroll through those really quickly. We're going to get better at the tech. That's why we're doing these to slowly get better at them. Um, hang on, I make sure I stop. Are y'all still seeing the poll or did I get rid of it? Yes, you're still seeing it? Oh, let's get rid of that puppy. Hold on, stop sharing, thank you. Okay, um, okay, Nan has an interesting point because none of these plot, none, none of these story elements exist in a vacuum, right? Story is a web. And so we can sort of artificially look at these things separately, stakes, character, plot, suspense, tension, momentum, all of it. But really they're all interconnected. And Nan makes the good observation that she guesses the stakes were high, but she didn't like the characters enough to care. So remember, readers don't care what's happening unless we care what's happening to, who it's happening to. The stakes can be high as all crap, but if we aren't invested in the characters, they will leave us cold. This is one reason I always say character is the basis of all story because everything stems from it. If we are not invested in the characters, we don't care what happens to them. We don't care what they have to gain or lose. It does not propel the momentum because we aren't burning to see how they're, whether or not they achieve their goal. So that's where everything starts to me. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about character. Let's take them one by one. Actually, let's go through just a couple. Um, Hang on, I want to talk a little bit more about what we were just talking about. Stakes were higher for Callie than for Lee. I agree with that, actually. Um, Callie was chapter one, and she was the one actually fighting for her life. And Lee was really just, for a reason we actually didn't know, <laughs> had taken, or a vague reason, I guess we knew partly, had taken a job defending wealthy criminals when she used to be more socially justice oriented. Um, Fighting for one's life seemed pretty high stakes, Krista says, yes. Um, house without windows. Oh, interesting. Susan makes, so the last time we did a one called the house without windows where the crime happens in, in, or at least we join the person who allegedly has committed the crime after it has just happened. And then we meet the defense attorney in the second one. She said the format reminded her of that. You know, a lot of genres have a formula. And it's not a bad thing necessarily. Romance has really, um, I don't want to say strict, but really widely accepted tropes. And if you don't adhere to those tropes, readers can get frustrated. So this is, I mean, these two, I would say House Without Windows skews literary, but in a lot of ways, it is this kind of um, suspense story. And it's interesting that they have that same structure. And also, I really like that observation uh, Susan, because what we're doing in doing this is learning to see those similarities and those patterns. All editing is, I always joke, is pattern recognition. So when you start to recognize this stuff in other people's work, you internalize it in your own. Um, if everything seems as high stake as fighting for your life, Claudia says, it all loses its importance, balance. Yeah, if we had two fighting for your life scenes back to back, that would be wearying for the reader. We need a minute to catch our breath. But I would argue that I agree that stakes didn't seem as high to me in chapter one. Propulsion didn't seem as strong. I didn't think character investment was as strong. I don't want to color y'all's views because I want to hear your thoughts. But I think it's great that you have a strong hook for a story that makes readers care what's happening. But then you got to keep us on the hook. And I did not feel as invested in chapter two or chapter one, I guess she doesn't actually label the chapter. So let's call this prologue in chapter one, Lee's chapter. I did not feel as engaged in, I did not feel the momentum was as strong. But I also agreed with some of the people in the prologue that the momentum, while the momentum was 
pretty good. And let's differentiate between momentum and pace. Momentum is just the forward movement of story. And your story should always, always be moving forward. Even if you are giving backstory, even if there's a flashback, it should move the story forward, by which I mean, advance the characters along the plot, further the, uh, or along their arc, further the plot, raise the stakes. But pace is the speed at which it's moving. So the little silly metaphor I always use is that both Niagara Falls and the Mississippi River have momentum. They are both moving toward the sea, but they move at a very different pace. The pace of chapter one was really strong. The pace of chapter two was a little slower and that's fine. It was that kind of a chapter. But more than that, I felt the momentum of chapter one was stronger and the momentum of moving forward in chapter one felt very backward looking to me. We got caught up in a lot of COVID stuff. We got caught up in backstory about her, I felt. Um, and, and I felt there was a fair amount of repetition. We're going to go through line by line in just a minute because that that's going to illustrate a lot of this. Uh, Carol says the second chapter was slower paced to her too. And Nan agrees Lee's chapter was heavy with backstory about her daughter and husband. And yet counterintuitively, I felt like we didn't get a lot of detail about it. Like I knew that they were divorced and that Walter was a good man. I knew that because we got told over and over that Walter was a good man, which was part of what was slowing the pace in that one for me. It felt like there was some repetition, but the reason was just basically, she said she was one of those bad women that felt vague to me. Now there could be a story reason that she's doing that. This could be something she is building across the story. Um, she's having difficulties with her daughter, but again, I didn't know why, like why is she, is it just that she's a teenager? She's clearly not having that with her dad though. Is she resentful of the divorce? But it didn't seem that she was at first. We didn't get a lot of clarity on that. So for me, yes, it was heavy on backstory, but it was light on detail. And that was one reason that I did not feel as invested in Lee's story. Um, some amusing lines. Yeah. Uh, humor is well used periodically in this. And I think there's room for humor in almost every story because it's a nice release and it can show personality of your characters. It gives the reader just a minute to sort of breathe. It can throw perspective on things. So she said the hand sanitizer flowed like peach schnapps at a prom. And one line like that draws attention to itself so much that we don't need to hear about it again. We get the, you can paint a whole picture of a COVID world with a few details. And one example I always use is, let's say you wanna say, you want to paint a picture that of a character walking into another character's house and it's pristine, perfect, high end, everything is ritzy. You can painstakingly describe everything she's seeing and the sub-zero refrigerator and the everything and paint the whole scene for us literally, but that is tedious and it's gonna slow your pace and your momentum and risk losing the reader. Or you can pick out a few really salient, very specific details let the reader's imagination fill in the rest. So let's say you do say, you know, gleaming, I don't know, what's an expensive countertop? Quartzite countertops, water falling down the expansive center island and reflected in the, I don't know, sorry, this is crap writing. It's top of my head. Reflected in the, uh, you know, perfectly fingerprint free stainless steel Viking appliances. That's all you have to say. You don't have to paint every detail. The readers are going to fill it in because now we have the idea. So I think she could have done less with the details about COVID. That hand sanitizer line would have been good. Mention of masks, maybe leave it alone. God knows we're all tired of COVID. We don't want to read a ton about it. Robin says the stakes for Lee got high further into the story. I agree with that. As soon as we knew, well, yes and no. As soon as we knew that Andrew was Trevor, stakes got higher because then we find out that she had a hand in finishing murdering Buddy, which was also an interesting statement because Buddy seemed pretty murdered at the end of the prologue to me. Um, and that is a good, that's a new story hook and question. So now we want to know what happened after we left the scene in that prologue. Uh, let's just look at a couple more messages. Krista says, oh, interesting. Krista says that in the table of contents, there are chapter numbers, but not all of the parts are chapters. So now that makes me wonder if, uh, again, I didn't read the whole thing, if the Cali chapters are maybe the ones that are not numbered. And we do go back to those scenes later. And this really isn't a prologue, but more of a dual timeline. 
Ruby straddled her broomstick as she prepared to fly away. So that's good character, right? That tells us a little something about who Ruby is. I thought that was a very good detail, but it was also, again, I felt like there was some repetition there because she also in that area spends a lot of time talking about what a pain in the ass Ruby is. So it's kind of, this is show and that's tell. And when you have show and tell of the exact same point, it feels like redundancy to readers and it can stall your pace. So pick the stronger one and it's generally show, but not always. All right, uh, let's do one more poll and then we're gonna go line by line. Just cause why not? Let's do, we talked about momentum and pace. Let's do suspense and tension since the genre is what it is. I've got three questions here, um, just rating again. How well did the story raise questions that kept you hooked? And that's really all suspense that Nan likes polls. Yay. This is how I make it interactive because I wish this were more of a face-to-face -face discussion, uh, but the medium makes it a little hard. How well did the story raise questions that kept you hooked? That's what suspense is. It's creating a question in the reader's mind that we need to find the answer to. And if you can keep, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, will Buddy kill her or who killed Buddy? Suspense can be little questions. It can be, um, you know, you walk into the, into your house and go, Hey, honey, I'm home. And they just go and walk away. That creates suspense in both the character and the reader. Why, why are they doing that? That's the kind of question you want to create just constantly throughout your story. Why are they doing that? What does that mean? What is she thinking? What will she do next? Those are the turn the page questions. And so suspense belongs throughout your story in every genre. Then how effectively did they maintain story tension? And we talked about what that is. It's that edge of your seat feeling, that unresolved feeling, the friction, the push-pull, contrast. And also how effective did you find the two main twists? And that's Callie's age um, and the fact that she is not his wife and um, Lee and Andrew's connection. So I want to talk about the twists more specifically too. So um, I'll give y'all just one more second with that. And then we're going to post it. I think we'll post it. Okay. All right. This time I remembered to share. So um, how well did the story raise questions? I, I agree with this. There were a lot of good story questions from the beginning about her sort of mixed feelings about uh, Trevor, but also her mixed feelings about Buddy. Like it was interesting that she spoke of him very disparagingly, but also seemed to feel a draw to him, which was both interesting to me, but also for me, inadequately detailed because I didn't quite understand why. Like she is very unkind about Buddy, but, and she does say he once made her feel safe, but we also don't know enough about why that was important to her, except that her mom was kind of an unpleasant person. So for me, a lot of this boiled down to just more detail. It didn't feel as specific and concrete as I needed it to. And vague generalities will result in kind of a wishy-washy engagement from your readers. It's those concrete specifics that give us meat, that hook us into it. And ironically, the more specific you are, the more universal your stories will feel. If you try to be broad to appeal to the most number of people, you're not really going to appeal strongly to anybody. But if you get really, really specific, even if it is not directly pertinent, let's say, to a particular reader's experience, it may resonate with something in their experience that they can relate to more strongly, but not if it's vague. How effectively did they main story ten maintain story tension? Again, we've got mostly uh, good responses here, uh, a lot of fours. 63%, four out of five, meaning strong, and then threes and fives evenly divided. And how effective did you find the twist? This is interesting. I thought everybody would find these really, really effective, but we've got 56% five, really, really effective, 31% four, and 13% three, no ones and twos. Um, I thought they were good twists just because I did not see them coming, except again, uh, I wanted to see more. I thought I already shared that. I wanted to see more specificity in all of this. All right, we're going to go line by line. Let me just really quickly check our chat. You guys are being very patient with my tech issues. Thank you. Um, okay. Krista says the story does go back to summer 1998. So this is more a dual timeline. So that changes some calculus on the prologue. Yeah. Now we don't have to worry so much about is it, is it 
meeting the expectations that we might have for a prologue if it's a dual timeline story. Um, Chris says, Andrew's creepiness and his connection to Lee was as disturbing as Callie's age. I agree with that. He was a very, um, first of all, what he was accused of and the fact that there had been previous accusations made him a creepy character. We had, he was weird with her, but we had also seen him as a little boy, which I think is very interesting because it's really hard to it's really hard to dismiss and hate a child the way we might with an adult, especially when we see some of what forces shaped that child. So I suspect that the, that doing so was a deliberate choice slaughter made to keep in those gray areas, right? If you have a black and white villain, that's kind of boring. Black and white hero, kind of boring. Lee, again, black and, uh, is not a black and white character. I did not find her especially likable overall, but I did feel engaged with her. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why as we go through line by line. So let me share the screen of the excerpt that you guys hopefully read, and let's just start going through it. Um, Susan says really quickly before we start this, Slaughter gives us more why Callie loves Buddy much later in the story. Are you saying you would have liked to have seen that in the prologue? Um, when I thought it was a prologue, yes, I would have liked to have, because if that is all we're going to get of that scene, I needed to know more. If it's dual timeline, let me think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that can be unfolded as the story develops, I think, and we learn a little bit more about the character. So that does change it a little bit. So note to self, Tiffany, best to, uh, somebody had suggested this as a book and I hadn't read it, but I thought, oh, I would love to do a suspense because that's not one I work in very often uh, or I've presented very often, I should say. And so, um, yeah, if I had looked at that, that does change my opinion of the prologue a little bit. I still do think both these chapters are a bit long. I still think that the momentum could be stronger. So let's go through and look at why. Um, and you may feel differently and that's totally valid. And I would love to hear your reasons if you do. From the kitchen, Callie heard Trevor tapping his fingers on the aquarium. Her grip tightened around the spatula she was using to mix cookie dough. He was only 10 years old. She thought he was being bullied at school. His father was an asshole. He was allergic to cats and terrified of dogs. So this is a lot of tell right off the bat, which normally I would find a little like head spinny, but it, notice it's telling us a few things. And then she, in that last sentence, it's tying it all together in a way that makes that information, I think, feel relevant. Any shrink would tell you the kid was terrorizing the poor fish in a desperate bid for attention, but Callie was barely holding on by her fingernails. So it, take those sentences out. Let's say we take out this, he was only 10 years old, this part here. Then it's all tell. But because she is using these details about his life to fill in some context for him, now we understand why he's doing this in a desperate bid for attention. And we have sympathy immediately from the get-go for a character who we are seeing doing, you know, not the nicest thing, terrorizing some fish. We also immediately see that, Kelly, that Callie is tense. She's a little bit at the end of her rope. Uh, she's a lot at the end of her rope, actually, barely holding on by her fingernails. Tap, tap, tap. I like the way this is a visceral way that Slaughter kind of shows that uh, that almost like Chinese water torture feeling of drip, 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 drip. Like, you know how when you're at the end of your rope and those little things, just every single thing that's annoying you, every beat of it feels like one more straw on the camel's back. I like that. Um, then I do think she kind of goes... I felt like we got a little redundancy about how Callie was feeling um, frustrated and how her, and she was in pain and all of that. She rubbed her temples, trying to ward off a headache. Are you tapping on the aquarium? Like I told you not to, and this is such a kid thing, but also it takes on new meaning later because we understand that I guess who Trevor becomes the tapping stopped. No, ma'am. That could be a kid's little innocent, harmless lie, which I think is how we take it. But then later, we might look at this in a different light after we've seen that Andrew is Trevor. Are you sure? Silence. So she's also showing he does not maintain the lie when she presses him. She wants, I think, Slaughter wants us to see that there is good in this kid, as well as the potential bad that we later see develop. And why does she want us to? Probably to either invest us in him or to keep us off balance or both. Um, 
headache and ma'am make her seem older. Chris, that's a good observation because I, and Doug says initially this felt like it was a domestic violence household. The author does some very specific things. Let's talk about the twist really fast, actually. So the twist comes on page 14 of my version of this, which I just took the excerpt and I put it in standard manuscript format. So I don't know where it falls in the actual print version, but I think the whole prologue is 30 pages in this. So it's about halfway through the prologue. We get the twist that Callie is not in fact, Buddy's middle-aged wife, but a 14 or 16 year old babysitter. I'm not sure which, because it, he talked, she talked about having started sleeping with Buddy uh, and he sleeps with his 14 year old babysitter, but we also get a reference to it been going on for two years. So I'm assuming she's 16 now, but it's interesting to see. So this is a hard thing to do, right? To withhold information without seeming like you're manipulating the reader or coy, but to use our own assumptions against us so that we draw the conclusion you want us to draw. That's what she did extremely well in this chapter. How did she do it? Somebody pointed out, Chris pointed out headache and ma'am. So you wouldn't expect that from a young girl. Later, shortly, I think we see, um, uh, let's see, where is it? She starts to, yeah, we're going to go back to some of this. Don't fear. We start to see her, here we go, the throbbing pain of her knee because it popped. That's also not something you expect to see from a 16 year old or a teenager, let's say. Ro tried to rub the throb out of her knee. This is when I started to be like, okay, I get that her knee hurts. So we got it like one and done. You don't have to keep establishing it. Although I do think what she's going for here is that Callie's at the end of her rope. And so she's just kind of drilling these, my, I'm in pain. This kid won't be quiet. I'm at the end of my like we need to have sympathy for a girl who murders a man too. And of course we do because it's self-defense, but also we're seeing how she's at the end of her rope. And then this other unconscionable thing happens that pushes her over the edge. Um, this is another one I thought was very clever right there. The orange couch had two depressing his and her indentations on opposite ends. I don't know about y'all, but when I first read this, my immediate assumption was her and buddy, husband and wife. It seems like her house, she's going behind the bar. She knows where everything is. She's cleaning up. Uh, she noticed the camera months ago. So there's all these things. She's taking care of this little boy. She's waiting for Buddy to come home. He's always late. It's all these little things that are very cleverly designed simply to lead us to believe the things she wants us to believe so that she can do that twist. It's sixth sense, right? Where they, Where we are led to believe all the way through that Bruce Willis's character is a psychologist who's helping this boy by these clever little misdirections that Shamalian uses to use our own assumptions against us for his purposes. Slaughter is doing that same thing here. The drinking stay-at-home mom is a trope, so it's easy for us to think she's one. Absolutely, man. She's playing into our cliched stereotype of this character. Um, okay, so let's go back and do some more line-by-line -line stuff. Uh, right here. She plopped the dough, the tapping resumed like a metronome. She plopped out more rows on the three count, tap, tap, plop, tap, tap, plop. Here's the sentence we were talking about earlier. Callie was closing the oven door when Trevor suddenly appeared behind her like a serial killer. That's a little threatening all by itself, right? We may have a moment of unease. And then she diffuses that conflict, push, pull, that tension. He threw his arms around her saying, I love you. She held on to him as tightly as he held on to her. What does that tell us about the way she feels about him? Um, and then the way she acts here, the fist of tension loosened its grip on her skull. She kissed the top of Trevor's head. He tasted salty from the festering heat. We're getting a sense of a lot of things here. First of all, what kind of, uh, where are the details Kit says that suggest she is a young 16 year old? There are none. That's the point. She's trying to misdirect us. And the reason she has these popping joints that we would expect from an older person we later learn is because she well, has been a gymnast since she was young. So there's cohesion there. That's great. If she didn't explain that, then it would feel a little bit manipulative because then it's like, why, you know, why would this 16 year old be in such pain? But now we have a reason. So there's, there's, um, that's context. Kit says it still feels manipulative to her. That's, uh, uh, Lulu, you're in direct message, just so you know. Um, if you choose everyone, everybody will see your comments. She says she believes she's 14 in the scene. On page 17, Callie says, 
okay, it's my workshop. So I get to curse and I apologize if it bothers anybody fucking her son's 14 year old babysitter for the past two years. That's what was confusing to me. Lulu took this as she's 14 and it started when she was 12. I took it as she's 16 and it started when she was 14. And that's one of those things that's a lack of specificity. There may be a reason for that. She may not want us to know for sure, but if there's not, it's a vagueness that leaves us a little bit un, uh, adrift. Um, okay. So this is some good conflict right here, but it's also very revealing. Of, uh, and actually, let's keep going. He was standing completely still, but his nervous energy reminded her of a coiled spring. Okay, we've gotten a lot of info here on page. I'm still on page one of mine. Uh, we know that she's at the end of a rope. We know that he's being bullied. His father's an asshole. We know that he is terrorizing the fish in a desperate bid for attention. So already we have sympathy for him. We have some sympathy for her. We know, we assume that this is a mother son type thing. Um, I think I said, we already know she's on the, she's at the end of her rope, but, and yet she's making him cookies and yet she holds on to him tightly. And yet the tension loosens in her as tense as she is when the boy hugs her and says he loves her. She kisses his head. He tastes salty. She doesn't mind that salty, yucky sweat smell of this little boy. So now what do we know? Despite all of this, she loves this kid. She has some genuine affection for him. Um, his nervous energy reminded her of a coiled spring. We know a lot about Trevor. This is a little kid who's having a hard time right now. And yet there's still this dear sweetness in him. And yet he terrorizes the fish. And yet he's driving her crazy at trying to get cookie dough tapping on the thing. Um, this is, I think this is dear. Do you want to lick the bowl? The question was answered before she could finish asking it. He dragged a kitchen chair to the counter and made like Pooh Bear sticking his head into a honey pot. This is just sweet, right? This is just a typical little kid like, ah, yeah, I want batter. And he's all excited. And the Pooh Bear imagery is very sweet and innocent. So she is creating these contrasts. Just a few paragraphs ago, he was like a serial killer. He had coiled a coiled spring energy. So this is really interesting. Um, now we're going to learn a little bit about the setting and the world she's in. She uh, wipes the sweat from her forehead. He's all sweaty. The house was broiling, the air conditioning barely functioning. Everything felt sticky and wet. Um, he giggles when she sprinkles the water on him. So again, we've got this sweet little innocent moment. And then we get more context about their life. Two plates, two glasses, two forks. So there is a dad. We know that above the bully, but he's not here. And this seems to be uh, an ongoing situation that it's just the two of them. One knife to cut Trevor's hot dog into pieces. Why does that? Why is that important? We're just continuing to show she nurtures this boy. She takes good care of him. It's also continuing to create that assumption in us that this is his mother. Um, Krista says it's all creepy. Mixes Worcestershire sauce in with the ketchup, which is kind of sweet. Again, because it's she's catering to him. She's trying to make it fancy for him in the best way she knows how. And yet we also get the idea that there's something going on in the house. We haven't yet gotten the details of the setting, but because the AC is out and it's hot and sweaty, we may start forming a picture. Again, remember I talked about, you don't need to paint the whole picture. Give us little details. From that moment, I started to paint a picture of maybe not like a high-end house. Not that anybody's AC can't go out, but the fact that they're sort of suffering through it tells me maybe this is not, they don't have a lot of money. Um, she asks him a third time, were you tapping the glass on the aquarium? She caught the flash of scheming in his eyes. So now we're on page two. We've had all these sweetnesses about the boy. Let's go two paragraphs up right here where my cursor is. His lips curve up to the left when he smiles. He hands her the bowl to wash the same way his father's did. So we already know dad's a bully. So now she's starting to draw some parallels very subtly between him and the boy. Um, his hip pressing against her, so sweet. But then two paragraphs later, flash of scheming in his eyes, exactly like his father. Again, she's drawing parallels. You said they were starter fish, that they probably wouldn't live. This to me was the most disturbing part of this so far about the little boy, because, you know, they say, what's the, how do serial killers get started? Cruelty to animals. This kid doesn't seem to have any respect for the life of these fish that are, that, that, Callie bought him for pets. Oh, they're going to die anyway. So I might as well mess with them basically. And then I really like this next graph for what it reveals about Callie. 
we see a little more about who she is here. She felt a nasty response worthy of her mother. Notice that little tiny bit of context there. We don't get a lot of detail about it, about her background in this chapter. But that's, I, I just did a um, presentation about backstory for the writer on conference, writer unboxed on conference. And that's one of the things I talk about is that backstory is not always what happened in the past. Backstory is context on everything in a character's life that makes them a real fully fleshed person even in a scene where we are just seeing a little fragment of that. So she's starting to paint in those brush, stro brush strokes of context in a very subtle way that keeps the story moving forward. She's not stopping to say her mother's a jerk and she has an unpleasant childhood. She's just weaving it seamlessly into this sentence, but giving us a little grain of context. A nasty response worthy of her mother pressed against the back of her clenched teeth. So she wants to say this nasty thing, but she doesn't. That's again, that conflict, that push-pull, and it also tells us something about her. She's not going to be mean to this little boy right now. Your grandfather's going to die too. Should we go down to the nursing home and stick needles under his fingernails? I found this funny because I guess I'm sick, but also it really showed she had some spunk and personality, which could be foreshadowing for what we're about to see when she is attacked by a way bigger, older guy who can beat the crap out of her. And yet she has, we see that spunk in action there too. Um, the knife is the murder weapon. Oh, Chris Bailey. I didn't even see that. Well done. Up here where I was talking about the knife to cut the hot dog into pieces. Good good job, you. That's the that's Chekhov's gun on the mantle, right? Very subtle. She's just presenting the silverware that's that she's washed, but we're planting that seed that there's a knife right there so it doesn't seem like a deus ex machina, right? A little, a little gift of the gods basically it means a god in the machine and it's something that happens that has not been supported she's painted that right in there good on you chris and then krista clarifies that she meant that there's not a lot of difference between a grown man having sex with a 14 versus a 16 year old i agree with that but i also think there's levels of horror about that not that it's any less horrible if it's a 16 year old but it seems even more awful with a 14 year old to me because there is even more childish innocence, even more childishness, period, right? Even more childish innocence. This at 14, you might expect this child to be much less of a, I, I hate to use the term sex objects. It's grotesque to think about a grown man and a 16 year old, but teenagers are start, older teenagers are starting to explore their physicality in a way that maybe a younger child might not be. And that maybe adds to the horror of this. So for me, it was an important distinction. But again, these things are all subjective. Um, okay, let's skip on down. So she, she bites back on this. She doesn't say those words, but the spring, this is interesting too, the spring inside of Trevor coiled even tighter. She was always unsettled by how tuned in he was to her emotions. Not only does that tell us something, first of all, about them in this scene, not only does it continue to make us assume that this is mother and son, but notice how it sets up the next chapter when we see that Andrew has specifically suggested his, her sister, who used to be his babysitter, and she's laying the groundwork that this child is, maybe he's emotionally intelligent, maybe he's very empathic, maybe he is uh, sociopathic and good at picking up on people's, what's going on in people so he can exploit it, but she's starting to lay that groundwork here. Okay, she dried her hands on her shorts, nodding toward the aquarium. We should find out their names. So rather than being snarky, she turns it around to this sweet, positive way of redirecting the child's behavior, which is mature, but also loving, right? So we're continuing to reinforce the idea that she cares about this child. Again, important groundwork to have as the story develops. He looked guarded, always being always afraid of being the last one to get the joke. There's just some really sweet details about this boy that are poignant to me that continue to make him a gray area character in a very juicy way. Fish don't have names. Okay, and then she goes on, she's gonna name the fish and she's got the boy focused. There's more pain again, which feels redundant to me now. Um, and she distracts him by naming the fish and it's a sweet little game. And then his lips curved up at the left. Remember, that's just like his bully of a dad as he fought a smile. Bait. 
So again, it's like, it's a whiplash effect almost. Like this kid is sweet. There's a sweet moment. Oh, he's disturbing. And it keeps us really nicely off balance. Um, for when the sharks come and eat him. And then he laughs at that much too loudly. His pet, her knee throbs again. And then we have her looking around the room and here's where we get the, it painted a little bit more clearly. So again, we've got some, I want to get back to this bit about bait, which we're going to see again in a minute and the naming of the fish. But we take a little time here to just call out some specific details. She's not describing the room painstakingly, but um, stained shag, shag carpet, flattened sometime in the late 80s. So it's at least 10 years old. It's in crap shape. It's out of date. Shag carpet was not in at the time of this uh, scene. Puckered edges, orange and brown gray, uh, drapes. Y'all may not be old enough to remember that those were the colors of the 70s. So this is an even older house. These real specific details are painting a picture without her having to um, paint it painstakingly in every detail or tell us what she's trying. She could just say it was a dated old, you know, poorer house, but she's not. She's letting us form that conclusion based on details, based on pretty much just painting a picture for us. And what does that do? That directly engages the reader in the story, as opposed to us just being passively reading what she is um, unloading on us. It makes us a part of the story. And that's what keeps a reader engaged. Fully stocked bar with a smoky mirror behind it. Again, that's super 70s. Glasses hung down from a ceiling rack, four leather bar stools crowded around the L shape of the sticky wooden top. So I would argue that we're getting into a little bit of a, um, maybe, I would normally say over description, but in this case, I think it's important because of the camera and the fight that is shortly staged here. We need a very specific picture of the logistics in our mind and she is painting it for us. The entire room centered around a giant television. Why is that important? First of all, it's a contrast. This is an old, poor house, not well-maintained, dated. And yet, uh, there weren't giant televisions, I don't believe, back in the 80s, if I remember correctly. So that tells us that this is something new. It's high-tech. It's nicer than everything in the room. Tells us a little something about the priorities of the people in the house, but also it's about to take center stage because of what Buddy is doing. Uh, the uh, orange couch has two depressing his and her indentations and notice this little tiny piece of context on opposite ends. That tells us something we think about Buddy and Callie's relationship. We later see it's Buddy and his wife. The tan club chairs had sweat stains at the backs. The arms had been burned by smoldering cigarettes. So not only do we see this room, we get a sense of what happens in this room. Sweaty people cigarettes you know they're all watching tv this top is sticky nobody watches it we're getting a really clear picture of this world um doug talks about tvs back then had deep picture tubes which might be why it was described as large it might um chris says he the contrast for him of leaving trevor rolling on the floor laughing and then he slips his hand into hers it's just really good how she keeps unbalancing us however i would argue that she does it a lot Generally, I always joke one and done, but more is not always, more is often less in something like this. It's like with the knee thing, right? We know her knee is throbbing. We've now been told four times, ugh, COVID. We know they're in COVID times, but we keep being told it slows things down. That's impeding the reader engagement and their momentum. And you don't have to give it to us that many times. If you establish something well once, maybe a couple of times, don't keep doing it. So I would argue that this maybe goes on a little bit long because we already get the idea of this push-pull that Trevor's got both good and concerning qualities, that she loves him and gets exasperated with him. We don't have to see it as often as we do. Then we see a little bit of her playfulness, um, playfulness and intelligence, because look at her references for naming these. Um, some of them are just puns like anchovy, Genghis Carp, Mr. Darcy. She's quote, she clearly reads Austin. Um, and also she has a sense of humor in the way that she's naming the fish. So these are little subtle ways of continuing to develop a character. Remember, as you are doing it, especially early in your story, we need to see who your characters are immediately to begin to see it. You want to start laying in brush strokes of that because why? Readers don't care what's happening until we care who it's happening to. So these, these are the little kinds of, I call them breadcrumbs. You can just drop 
these little bitty details so that you are showing us who your character is brush stroke by brush stroke. We don't need big chunks of explanation. You don't have to worry about um, like telling us a whole bunch about the character. Let us keep seeing who they are in their actions, behaviors, reactions, in these little bitty details, like a response worthy of her nasty mother that she nonetheless bites back on because she doesn't want to do to this little boy what her mother does to her. That's a lot of telling detail about a character that's not telling. It's actually showing detail <laughs> about a character, but they are telling details uh, to be very confusing. Um, okay, we're talking about the TV in the chat, y'all. Yes, uh, TV, these days TVs are flat and not heavy, save for the fact that they like to watch TV. But that's what we need to know in this scene, that this is a room about watching television, that a lot else has been neglected in this room, but not that TV. And why is that important? We're going to see in just a minute. Um, okay, we we get the idea. We we go back to the cookies again. Trevor takes a bath. We again see that he we get this idea yet again that he says he's going to do something and doesn't always do it. Uh, she tells him he has to take a bath if he wants cookies, and she checks on him because in the past he has I guess lied about whether he took a bath or not. That he she says an amateur would claim victory when she hears the water because apparently he has tricked her before. So we already know this though, like, yes, that's a good detail, but it's a detail that's already been established. So to me, now we're starting, this is where momentum's starting to slow down a bit to me. She goes and checks on him. He's not doing soap. Uh, yet again, she doesn't upbraid him because why? We get to hear it again. She's exhausted and her back ached and her knee was pinching. We know. Then she starts to drink. Um, I also thought the martini glass, this was an interesting contrast. It's just these little details I, I want to point out because this is the stuff I think it's easy to overlook. And when you're analyzing someone uh, in your own work and when you're analyzing someone else's work, it's really instructive to see how these tiny details can be really telling. So here she fills a martini glass. There's something mature to me. A, I don't mean in a good way necessarily, but older to me. Who drinks martinis? Older people drink martinis. What do young people drink? Daggeries, baby. So the fact that she fills a martini glass was one more little detail that to me was misdirecting me to assume she was older, but look what she fills it with. So that's like a subtle little indication that she is not, that she is younger. Captain Morgan and Sprite, which is a kid's drink in an adult's glass, which tells us something about her too, right? It tells us she's maybe trying to be more mature. Why not drink that in a regular glass? And yet she's an alcoholic, which again, we would not expect a teenager to be. So this is another thing, or I shouldn't say alcoholic. She's engaging in alcoholic seeming behavior at this point. Um, and that does, again, does not lend itself to our imagining that this is anything other than Buddy's middle-aged fed up wife. Um, notices a flash out of the corner of her eye. Kelly's, or Callie's first thought had been, sprained back, tricked me, and now her retina was detaching. So again, I'm bored. I'm so bored with the knee at this point. I get it. But I want to talk about something that I had a question about, and I wondered what you guys thought about. She has her have discovered the camera a few months ago, but not do anything about it. She has attributed it to different things. There may be a reason for that later in the story. Had I read it, I might know that. But to me, it felt like it lowered the impact if than if she had found the camera right now, which to me felt a lot more shocking, startling. It lets us be a part of this discovery. It shifts everything. Now it says something different that she knew it was there and didn't say anything about it. Maybe that's the point. But I wondered if that was a deliberate choice or um, just not as effective a use of this device as perhaps she might have had. Um, so then we go back and we learn how she discovered the thing and it's hidden under there. And she immediately attributes it to Buddy using it for leverage against his buddies to, that he could use to close a deal. So, you know, we're over and over, we're getting her sh shoddy opinion of Buddy. Um, Claudia says she thought it helped the pacing not to interrupt the fight with it, which I agree, but, I, but she could have discovered it right here is what I'm saying, the fight before the fight begins. I don't know if you can hear that because I have noise canceling on here, but my dogs are losing their mind. And if you can't hear it, I apologize for them. Um, uh, okay, so then she drinks some more. We talk a little bit about Buddy. Here's a good telling detail also. 
And she even points it out in case we miss it. It's a monogrammed towel, which already seems right out of place in this environment, doesn't it? So that's an interesting contrast detail. The logo sums up Buddy in a nutshell. It's not a big team. It's the Division II Bellwood Eagles, a high school team that went zero to 10 last season. Big fish, small pond. Takes one little small detail to begin to paint a picture of a character who hasn't even come on stage yet in show rather than tell. So that's a really good way to begin to paint the character the way we're talking about one brush stroke at a time. Um, okay, so she drinks the rest of the rum. He, he hugs her again. She kisses, he kisses her again. She kisses him again. He still tastes sweaty. She'd fought enough battles for the day. Is this feeling repetitive to anybody? Again, this is subjective. It may not to you, but to me, it did. We have already established all of this. So again, here I'm starting to lose a little interest. Pace is slowing for me. All she wanted was for him to go to sleep so that she could do what? Drink away the aches and pains. I think this is mentioned seven or eight of the aches and pains. So then they wait for the aquarium. She tells him about her first fish. Um, he turns docile. All this is sweet. But again, we have seen this dynamic already of him pushing boundaries, being a little disturbing, and then something sweet and how well she handles him. To me, if I were editing this, I would have suggested cutting to just one iteration of this dynamic, maybe two, because I think this is the third time we've seen it and we don't need it. And then we're going to hear it again here, a routine about an argument about how many cookies he could eat, spilled milk, another argument, a struggle to get him into his pajamas. Um, this I would let go just because it's still continuing to convey the idea of this being a mother and a son. Um, okay. I, we're at 17 minutes and I don't want to, a couple of y'all are saying that uh, you need to go. And I know that we're going to end this in 15. So we haven't even gotten to the fight yet, but I do want to skip over to chapter two and do a little bit of this kind of analysis. Um, while I'm doing that, I'm also going to say that I felt like the fight itself went on a little long and somebody said it felt a little bit egregious to them. I had that exact same feeling. It started to feel a little, um, Oh, what's the word I want? Like sensationalist almost. Now I am not necessarily, I am a reader of suspense and I'm an editor of suspense, but not necessarily this kind of sort of criminal suspense, this more violent kind of scene. So just for me, my personal tastes, it was a bit much, but I also felt like, again, we got a lot of repeated dynamics with Buddy coming at her, Buddy threatening her, her looking for a way to escape that started to draw it out a little bit to me. Um, but let's go over to, yeah, I'm still scrolling just FYI and we're in the middle of the fight now and that's a really long fight scene. Okay, so on page 25 of 47 in this format, uh, Gayla agrees she felt like the fight went on too long. Krista says, well, oh, good point, Krista. Was her not confronting him about the camera when she first found it a way to convey subtly that this is not her house? Maybe so. She doesn't feel she has the right to say something. That's an excellent point. Um, Cynthia says she's picking up on some redundancies now. And Lulu said she didn't notice it the first time she read it. So that's one of the reasons we do this three-step process, right? That's why I would never edit a story that I had not already read in its, in its entirety. Although I know some editors do that. They just plunge in and start editing. You have got to orient yourself to the story because you need to know, first of all, what happens. And then you go back in when you're doing this at home, watch the movie and then go back and analyze it. Read the book, read the scene, and then go back and analyze it. You really don't see this stuff as clearly until you already know what the scene is about, what the story is about. Then you go through and you dig out the clues, the way that the author, the deliberate ways the author used technique to convey those things. Um, okay, so Lee Collier is watching a show that her daughter is choreographing middle school. And she's seen it a whole bunch of times. Let's just go through line by line. Lee call your bitter lip as a seventh grade girl belted out, you got trouble to a captive audience. A gaggle of tweens slipped across the stage as Professor Hill warned the townsfolk about out of town Jaspers, luring their sons into horse race gambling. Not a wholesome rate, trotting race, no, but a race where they sit right down on the horse. She doubted, okay, so right, he, right now to this point, I know nothing about the character. 
that's okay, really, because this is chapter two and you have a little more leeway than in chapter one, where you kind of want to start conveying a sense of character from the moment we join the story. But I would argue that it might not be a bad idea to give us some indication rather than her biting her lip, which, you know, bit her lip is a cliche. So maybe we could do a little better than that when we're trying to talk about what a reaction is, but it's also a little vague. We don't know what it means, really. So if, if instead of biting her lip, maybe she had some other reaction that told us a little more about her. So this is a seventh grade girl belting out the music man. What if her reaction is totally, is like rolled her eyes or so, you know, like that's also a cliche, but it's a little more definitive. And it tells us a little more about Lee, that this is a woman watching a middle school show and being like, oh my God, this is the worst. And that immediately we have more of a picture of her. But that's okay. So we're about to get a picture of her. She doubted a generation that had grown up with, <laughs> uh, we'll just say WAP, murder hornets, COVID, cataclysmic social unrest, and being forcibly homeschooled by a bunch of depressed day drinkers really understood the threat of pool halls. A lot of tell there that's giving us a lot of context about the world that they're in, but it also is telling us a little something about her. Um Lee had to hand it to the drama teacher for putting on a gender neutral production of The Music Man, one of the least offensive and most tedious musicals ever staged by a middle school. Um, and then we find out why they're here. Um, for me, this was a lot of tell. Like I was, I did not feel as engaged in this chapter. Her daughter had just turned 16. She would thought the days of watching, now this is a little revealing. Um, this is how Lee is characterizing middle school children, nose pickers, mama's boys, and stage hogs breaking into song. So that is starting to paint a picture for us, but it's not a very likable picture, is it, so far? So that's interesting. Let's notice that she's not necessarily a character we might dig. And yet, if you were engaged at this point, why? How did the author keep you interested? Um, and I have a suggestion for why I think in this next line. But then Maddie had taken an interest in teaching choreography. So here they were trapped in this hell hole of trouble with a capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. So this to me was the paragraph that had the most personality and the most information so far in this chapter. Because first of all, maybe I don't like Lee so much just now, but then right there, I just learned that despite the fact that she doesn't want to be here, her daughter is doing this and it's important to her and she has shown the hell up. So I give her a point and I'm willing to continue to stay invested in this character. And then the way that she puts this makes me laugh. It's a hell hole of, and then this is a, if you're not familiar with the musical, this is a line from a song, trouble with a capital T that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. And that's funny. So I'm seeing a little personality in her right now. Snarky as she is, I'm like, okay, I'll give you, I'm interested. Um, and then she looks for Walter and how, what context do we get about Walter? So he's her ex-husband. How do we know that? She immediately says, first of all, we don't even know who he is yet. She looked for Walter. He was two rows down. So he's not sitting next to her. That's one clue. Closer to the aisle, head tilted at a weird angle, sort of looking at the stage, sort of looking at the back of the empty seat in front of him. Lee didn't have to see what was in his hands to know that he was playing fantasy football on his phone. We still don't know who he is necessarily, but we know he's pretending to watch the show. She slipped her phone out of her purse and texted, Maddie's going to ask you questions about the performance. Um, Walter kept his head down. But, and so now we may be getting some context about who Walter is. We might assume that's her, Maddie's father. Um, she could tell from the ellipses that he was responding. I can do two things at once. Maybe it's snarky. Maybe it's funny. She types back, if that was true, we would still be together. Maybe it's snarky. Maybe it's funny. Then we get this detail that tells us. He turned to find her. The crinkles at the corners of his eyes told her he was grinning behind his mask. Lee felt an unwelcome lurch in her heart. Okay, we're getting a lot of information about these two. We know they're not together. We know they used to be together. They're sitting two rows apart. We know they still have a decent enough dynamic to text back and forth. Um, and it's teasing. We know that now because the crinkles behind his eyes. So it's good natured. So we know that their relationship is not contentious. She felt an unwelcome lurch in her heart. We know she still has feelings for him, but she doesn't want to. That's a lot of information from uh, this much dialogue. So this is what I mean by creating character and doing it in a way, doing it with the brush strokes, right? You're not giving us everything all at once and you're not vomiting up tell on us. You are showing us little by little, brush stroke by brush stroke, who these characters are, what their relationship is with each other, what is their history. She's painting a picture. And then we do get some tell because we need some. The marriage had ended when Maddie was 12. 
But during last year's lockdown, they'd all ended up living at Walter's house. And then Lee had ended up in his bed. And then she'd realized why it hadn't work out, worked out in the first place. Walter was an amazing father, but Lee had finally accepted that she was the bad type of woman who couldn't stay with a good man. This could have been an intriguing detail for me because it's contrast, right? Like he's great. She's obviously still attracted to him. She still has some sort of a feeling for him. They have a decent relationship. They live together during uh, the lockdown. So this is, they can obviously get along. They do nice things for their daughter to make their, her life well. Uh, they had sex. <laughs> he's a great father. And yet she can't stay with a good man. So that does raise some questions. Why not? Is he the first one? What broke them up? You know, how does he feel about it? Who wanted it? But for me, we never really addressed those. Those would have been good questions if we'd gone on to continue to paint in brush strokes of detail, but we don't. So for me, it felt incomplete and it left me um, feeling like the context on them was vague. And then she goes, she says, he's an amazing father and a good man. And then she says that over and over, but without offering any more context as to why she's not with him anymore. Um, so then we find out a lot about COVID, which some of it's funny, you know, the night of the long nasal swabs, but it, it gets, it gets a little, you know, we've got it here in this paragraph. We've got it again here in this paragraph. And it also, this is another thing you have to be careful of when you're writing about things like this, this dates, this manuscript, even already, you know, three years after all this happened, this feels a little dated, doesn't it? Now it does set us in a time period and that's good, but you've also kind of, this is the present moment story and it's locked in this present moment forever. If we read this 10 years from now, it's going to feel like a relic. Uh, let's look at, um, Doug says he liked how Slaughter revealed the divorced couple of Lee and Walter and their dialogue interplay. I do too. It's showing us their relationship. He says, he quotes, the men were the problem with this game. You could have one guy, possibly two on your team, but three or more and all the women would probably end up chained to beds in an underground bunker. He says, this reveals what Lee thinks of men in general. And I completely agree with that. Notice how it also sets the stage for where she's about to go, which is to have to defend a wealthy white rapist man, accused rapist man, serial accused rapist man. So she, we're setting up those contrasts. We're set it, We're getting a glimpse of how she feels about all of this. And then we learn how she doesn't really like all these people, but she comes up with her fake fantasy football. And not only does she not like them, but we also see she's very observant, but she's also kind of like, she's not observant with the milk of human kindness necessarily. She, Janie Pringle um, sold all this stuff on the black market. Jillian Nolan knew how to make schedules. Lisa Regan was frighteningly outdoorsy so she could do things like build fires. We're getting an idea. She not only observes things about people, but she sees relationships transactionally. Uh, Deneen Milner punched a pit bull in the face. Ronnie Copeland always had tampons in her purse. Tommy Adams would blow anything with a pulse. She's like, she knows who these people are. She's obviously enmeshed in this community. That's another brushstroke of context. She obviously... She does not seem to like any of these people over much. Some of them she seems not to have a very good opinion of. Um, Daryl Washington quit his job to take care of the kids while his wife worked a high paying corporate gig, which isn't that exactly what she did, which was sweet, but Lee wasn't going to survive the apocalypse only to end up fucking a meatier version of Walter. So there's another little nugget of detail around the fact that she appears not to like nice guys, but we don't have any context as to why. So I felt a little adrift with that. And then we get Doug's line he just quoted about the men that's very revealing. Um, and then she gets the call from her lawyer. Well, first she texts her daughter and her daughter is a bit um, not so receptive. And we see that they are not having a great relationship and not right here with this line, we see that this has been going on for quite some time. So that is a negative context. This is what a thousand cuts felt like. Um, but for social media, Lee would have no idea that her daughter was still capable of smiling. So we're seeing that this is a pattern, but we don't have a lot of information as to why, what changed, whether it's just Lee and her daughter, what brought it about, whether there's some sort of particular specific disharmony between them. So it felt, again, a little bit vague to me. Um, more COVID stuff that felt a little bit uh, repetitive, more stuff about 
how she misses her good relationship with Maddie, but still no indication of why it's bad. We're right at time. So I, uh, I would love to keep going this way. I think in the future, and I'd love to hear y'all's opinions on this. I think we'll shorten, even though I like seeing contrasts in chapters like this, I think we'll shorten some of the stuff that we're looking at because by the time we go through little by little like this, it does take time. And I think that going through it line by line can be really instructive, but you've got to lay that groundwork first. So I'll probably send out a survey to see how these are serving you guys, because I want to I want to figure out a way. It's a little hard to do it without direct chat, but I want to figure out a way where this is not only valuable to you as far as learning to do this on your own, but to be able to have more back and forth so that we can turn it into more of a discussion. I'm going to try to keep doing these once a month. I'm going to try to keep them free. If you uh, want to tell people about them, feel free. The sign up is on my website, foxprinteditorial.com. That guide that I have for Analyze Like an Editor, that is a really good guide for not only, as I said, you doing this on your own. It'll walk you through each of the steps as we've been doing today, but it'll be good for critiquing, for giving to some of your critique partners. I always recommend if you want to direct the feedback you get from people to be actionable, give them specific questions that lead to actionable things for you to know. So rather than asking someone, you know, can you give me your impressions, which is a little vague and doesn't may yield things like, oh, I didn't like it, or you should change this. You can say, was there anywhere that your interest flagged? And if so, where, and do you know why? So you're not trying to find out their opinion of what's not working in your story. All you're doing is taking the temperature of their reactions which is how you get the feedback for you to create the story you want to create, which is what we're doing in here. Notice we're noticing our own reactions to something. And then we're digging into those to figure out how did the author create that in me? Meaning how did she put it on the page, which is the hardest disconnect for us as writers to get our vision on the page, the way we intended for it to be when we're, when we know so much in our heads and it's hard for us to know whether we have conveyed that in a way that the reader understands it. Thank you for joining me. And I will announce, uh, I think we're going to do an episode, a podcast episode for the next one that has some really great storytelling and something you guys can listen to like in an hour on a walk or cleaning the house. Thanks for joining me and I'll see you next month.